So hi, my name is Garrett Bloomstrand. I'm a hydrologic and hydraulic engineer. Uh, currently working with the St. Paul district, but mainly attached to the RMC West and Lakewood right now. And yeah, sorry. Today we're going to discuss one of the foundation inputs in RMC Best Fit, uh, which is systematic data. So we'll cover the process to create your systematic data record, uh, as well as the critical volume duration that's used in Best Fit to estimate your input volume duration frequency curves. So. In this lecture, we'll learn how to obtain systematic annual maximum inflow data, how to put it into RMC Best Fit, and we'll also uh, cover a brief introduction to the multiple grubs back test, which is how we test for low outliers in our systematic data set. So RMC Best Fit <clears throat> currently supports three different data types, uh, systematic data, interval data, and then perception thresholds or threshold data. So within the current version of best fit input data is required to be a block annual maximum and it's assumed to be independent and identically distributed. So all that means is a flood event that occurs in year one won't impact a flood the following year in year two and that flood in year two won't impact a flood in the following year in year three. So all of the events are independent. Um, so all the systematic data entered in RMC best fit is going to be an irregular annual value. That just means it's not occurring exactly one year apart. It's irregular because you might have a flood in April, 2020, May, 2021, that sort of thing. And it'll all be representative of the critical inflow volume duration, which we'll get into a little bit later on in this training too. Okay. Um, so what are some of your data sources for systematic data? So. You can collect regular prescribed time interval data uh, using some kind of profile defined protocol from sources like the USGS or like in the state of Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has a lot of active stream gauges that collect systematic data. In best fit, these systematic values are modeled as exact measurements with no uncertainty. Um, and like Carolyn alluded to in the previous lecture, if you have a highly suspect data point, you can represent that using an interval data point instead of a systematic data point if you're not confident in that measurement. So systematic data is commonly obtained from a stream gauge. Uh, however, inflow data for a dam can also be calculated based on the mass balance considering the storage equation for level pool routing. So just inflow minus outflows change in storage. So if you're recording your daily elevations or stages at the dam and outflows from the dam, you can reverse route that using the level pool routing equation and estimate what your inflow would be. Uh, it's also a great idea to review water control plans, water control manuals, um, design documents, and other digital paper records maintained by the dam owner. For a lot of these risk assessment studies, they will try to come up with historical storms um, within the water control manual that occurred before the dam was present, and those can be really good sources of information for your analysis as well. And when you're looking for available USGS gauge data, um, within this NWIS mapper, uh, where you have a lot of this information, make sure you toggle on the inactive gauges as well, uh, because you know USGS gauges, depending on the need for gauging and that sort of thing, sometimes they're funded, sometimes they're not. And so there's a lot of good information out there with those inactive gauges that can help augment your record too. So available inflow data typically consists of peak values such as the annual maximum series time series data with time steps that are hourly or da daily average flow. And the inputs to RMC best fit for a flood hazard analysis are typically the block annual maximum values for the critical duration. So if you had a two day critical inflow duration, but you had a one day uh, daily average data set, you would go through, estimate what that was uh, for your total record, and then you'd pick out the peak value for each year. And that's what actually goes into RMC Best Fit. And during the one of the workshops, we'll practice uh, one method that can be used to calculate the annual maximum volumes for the critical duration, given a time series of daily average flow. So, it's very important that we work with an annual maximum series because you know we're doing an analysis for floods. So we're really interested in what's the highest value that occurred for each year that we can use to inform our overall loading curve and the end result. Uh, you also need to ensure that the annual maximum series is the same duration as the watershed's critical inflow duration. So for example, if we determine that the watershed has a three day critical inflow duration, then we wanna make sure that the inflow volume frequency curve that we develop uses a three day uh, inflow volume data set for your systematic record. Uh, there are really two ways to do this. The first one here is listed. HEC puts out a software called HEC DSS view. 
Um, essentially, if you have a one day daily data set, it's a two step process where you can compute a forward moving average, and then you can just pick out what the peak flow would be for your critical duration of interest. Um, it's not currently in RMC best fit, but it is planned to be able to do this within the software. But another easy way to do it is in HEC DSS view. If you do a volume duration frequency analysis, the 1st step of that is to actually extract volume duration data. And that's really convenient and we use that a lot at this time, because what you can do is if you're not sure what your critical inflow duration is, or you're going to do a sensitivity test. You can put in multiple different durations, extract it. It takes 2 seconds to run and then you have all those data sets set up for if you want to go back and do a sensitivity test. So, at, the, at this point, HCC SSP is really useful for coming up with that information. And this is just showing how you get to that tool within the HCC DSS view software. Because after you come up with your forward moving average data set for like your 2 day flows, you need to convert it to uh, an annual maximum series. And there's a maximum tool within DSS view that allows you to do that. So, when developing the systematic inflow data sets, we want to consider a couple of important factors and I'll list a few here for your consideration. Um, like Carolyn noted, uh, you want to consider whether the dam in our study has upstream dams that cause regulation effects on the inflow record. Uh, if it does, you, know, you should remove those impacts from the dam because you're probably not going to be able to get an accurate loading curve and come up with like an accurate estimate of the risk to your project. If you have a large upstream dam or more than one large upstream dam that impacts flood floods at your site. Uh, another thing to consider is what are the major storm mechanisms in the watershed? Um, you know, you need your data to meet that IID assumption and be homogeneous. And a great example is watersheds out on the East Coast that experience rainfall driven events, which is from inland systems or hurricane driven events. Those are two very different mechanisms that cause flood. Or in the Midwest or some mountainous regions, snow melt driven floods versus rainfall floods. So you should take a look at that and see. Is your data set truly homogeneous uh, if you have these different mechanisms? And like they said, you can talk offline. There are ways to go about doing a mixed population analysis. Um, that's actually an ongoing area of research for Bulletin 17C. It's something they address that they need to look at as well. Then also look at whether or not the watershed has seasonal storm differences. Um, like I noted, rainfall driven storm events versus maybe snow melt driven storm events or in Minnesota, North Dakota, where I'm from, we get uh, rain on the snow as it's melting and that produces pretty bad floods. And then if the watersheds in the semi arid Western portion of the United States, sometimes your annual peak flows uh, or maximum records can have very low flow values or zero flows. Um, if this is the case, you might need to do some additional work to estimate risk or your systematic data set. And then another major major consideration is if there's been major changes in land use or land cover over the period of record. A good example of this is for the USA Los Angeles district in the California area. There have been significant increases in urbanization over the period of record. Um, the Los Angeles district actually commissioned a study on this and they did find that this changed their runoff over time just because they have so much impervious area and development that they're actually getting higher rates of runoff now than they used to. And so, if that is the case, you, know, you might need to account for that because you may have a non homogeneous period of record if you're using the last 120 years, but they've been urbanizing heavily in the last 60 or 70 years. Um, sometimes data is available that can allow us to extend the inflow record uh, beyond whatever systematic record we have just for our site. There are a few different methods that can be used to extend the inflow period of record. Um, a couple of them are listed on this slide. So, 1 of the best is look for nearby USGS gauges. Um, ideally, it would be upstream or dam upstream or downstream of your dam site. There are a lot of cases where that site was already gauged before the dam went in and you sometimes, depending on the difference in drainage area can just adopt those flows. Uh, another method that's commonly used. Is a drainage area regression and that's basically just a weighted average of the drainage areas times the flow, you know. That fee value is often 1.0, but what I've found is that as you as you get larger differences in drainage areas between your two sites, that fee value typically changes. But you can also come up with that value if you're going through and you have two known sites. You can just use your two known sites to come up with a separate fee value for that. And then the last one is in Bulletin 17C. Uh, there's the maintenance of variance extension. And all this is, it's a linear regression method. Um, it's almost like doing a Y equals MX plus B with linear regression, except in that case, you're minimizing the sum of square errors. 
versus this, you're minimizing the variance. So you're trying to maintain the variance of your data set. But it's actually a pretty easy calculation. The latest version of HTC SSP allows you to do both move one and move three record extension. So <clears throat> I want to briefly mention a few future developments that are going to be available in the next version of RMC Best Fit. So there will be several additional options for input data in the future. It'll allow the user to enter a period of record time series data so that all data prep can be handled within RMC Best Fit. Currently, we do a lot of processing outside within HEC DSS view, HEC SSP, or sometimes Microsoft Excel. Uh, and that works, but we want everything to be housed within one piece of software. So eventually, users will be able to develop block, block maximum data for annual, monthly, and seasonal, or peak over threshold data. Uh, users will be able to manipulate the data for moving average, like volume duration, or moving sum, like rainfall intensity duration. And users will also be able to perform hypothesis tests on data to ensure the samples are independent and identically distributed. So this is what it looks like in RMC Best Fit when you're putting in your systematic data. So now that you have an annual maximum series, uh, we'll walk through how to actually enter that data into RMC Best Fit. So within RMC Best Fit, first you just create new input data. Um, the three options to do this are to click on the project in the menu bar and select new input data, or right click on the input data in the project explorer frame and select create new. Um, you can also hit control new, it's one of the window shortcuts, and create a new data set there. So there's projects, there's the window to explorer. So the newly input, the newly created input data set will appear in the Project Explorer and the tab documents. So that's what that looks like. And a new row can be added for the data by selecting the Add Rows button of the table column. Um, RMC Best Fit requires an input for the year and a value for the annual maximum flow or volume within your systematic record. And the plotting positions are automatically calculated. And there are several ways to enter data. So you can either type in the values manually or you can copy and paste from another application. And you don't need to pre-put in all the rows. Like if you just have one like this and you're copying and pasting from a spreadsheet, RMC Best Fit will figure it out and it'll create the rows that you need. So plotting positions, um, you can view the input data as a chronology plot or as a frequency plot by toggling the radio buttons below. Um, RMC Best Fit by default uses the Hearst Stedinger plotting positions that are described in Bulletin 17Z. Um, this default plotting position parameter is where it's just the rank divided by the sample size plus one. So uh, the user can change the plotting position parameter using the drop down menu. And the benefit of using the Hearst Stedinger plotting positions, if you do, is that, that formula, those formulas in that method allow you to plot non standard flood data. Uh, or account for it. So if you have interval data, perception threshold data, that sort of thing, the Hirsch settings your plotting positions will allow you to get those plotting positions more accurately for your full data set. Oops. Sorry. So now that the annual maximum series has been entered, uh, you can also perform a low outlier test by selecting the run button. So the default test can be used, or you can manually enter a user-defined low outlier threshold. So currently, RMC Best Fit implements the multiple grubs BEC test uh, as the low outlier test. And details in this test can be found uh, in Bulletin 17C. So the general purpose of the low outlier test is to identify low floods that have significant leverage on the upper right tail of the frequency curve, so the flood region. Any floods that are identified as a low outlier or potentially influential low flow are removed from the systematic data and replaced with a threshold during the analysis. Uh, we'll learn more about thresholds later. So low outliers can occur in mixed populations when there are different flood mechanisms causing the flood. Uh, for example, low outliers are relatively common in the semi-arid regions. Um, these floods don't tell us much about the large floods we're interested in, but they help us inform how frequently those floods occur. So, they can impact the shape of the upper end of the frequency curve, so we don't omit them outright, but they also tell us, well, how often do the big floods actually occur? So engineering judgments needed to decide whether or not to adopt the uh, results from the multiple grubs back test. So you can look at the plots, and oftentimes you might need to make decisions about what you include or what you don't include. And sometimes this involves actually running your inflow volume duration analysis to look at how the upper end of the frequency curve is represented by the plotted data as well. Um, these are some additional resources that the RMC has produced um, that can help you find systematic data sets. Uh, 
the websites listed above, uh, but these are great resources. I've used them before when I'm coming up with systematic data before. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email Carolyn or Alan or I about them.